So, as I was saying before we started recording, I have this theory about aliens. Here we go. The government knows aliens exist, and not only this, they know that aliens are peaceful, and if they wanted to destroy us, they would have already done it already. Like, if all of the stuff we know about, like, Area 51 is even, like, remotely true, that, like, they have any evidence, and it seems pretty obvious at this point they've had evidence and they've just not released it. Listen, if if aliens have been here for 50 years and not done anything with the technology they have, why would they be like, you know what, let's let humans get stronger and more capable of defending themselves against us? They would have wiped us away a long time ago. So my theory is, and don't you shake your head at me, Elliot. I haven't is shaken that, it. Okay, just slow moving it. <laughs> so my theory is that the government thinks that aliens would tell us, like, your economic system is killing the planet. Let us teach you our ways. So they've invested heavily. Alien socialism. Yeah. And they've invested heavily in propaganda films around aliens for the last 70 years. So that even if aliens came and were nice to us, we would be suspicious about it. We would never trust it. Even if they're like, you know you're killing the planet. We know you're killing the planet. Look at this technology we have. Let us help you. We would still say no, right? Like, absolutely. We would not take that. I have a rebuttal, and I this is what I truly believe. Aliens do exist, and they do come and visit us, but I think this is just a funny vacation, like, zoo where they come and, like, check things out, and, like, fuck around, and a couple of people crash and fucked it up, and, like, they've ruined it for everybody else, but basically, like, <laughs> this is just a destination spot where it's, like, look at this, like, you know, look at these fucking mongrels. Yeah, look at these, look at these crazy, like these crazy beings that, like, there's a bunch of them. They replicate like crazy, and they have nuclear weapons, and like they can blow up suns if they want to, but like instead they just blow each other up. Like, look at it; it's funny. You are saying that like Earth is Florida for aliens. Yes, yes, I'm saying we're all Florida men to aliens. Yes, <laughs> interesting. <laughs> Welcome back. It's it's another episode of the Poor Pearls Almanac, and you've never heard us talk about aliens before. I don't think. Well, this right? is this is taking like a hard turn now. We're like, yeah, the topic of the podcast has shifted forever. Yeah, this all everything from here on out is aliens. Yeah. starting today. Yeah, and That's I'm gonna, I'm going to be doing all the lecture episodes. But I'm going to start writing now. So hell yeah, I can't wait. You're ready to take a break, Andy. Yeah, it's finally paying off. <laughs> Just kidding. So, uh, yeah, my name's Andy, and I'm joined by my good friend Elliot, who's a strong and firm believer in the Earth is Florida campaign. To aliens, yes. The Earth is Florida to aliens. They come and visit and look at all the stupid shit that we do. You can't deny it. There's, well, no, there's no denying that. <laughs> I mean, I'm kind of on board with it now. See, I, it's easy. To, know, it's easy to explain because everybody can but, see it. You can all understand it. It just makes too much sense. It's not like, even a conspiracy it, it, at that point. You know, the thing is, I'll, and I'll give you this, and I think it's really uh, something to appreciate in your argument, is that when we talk about aliens, we always talk about them like they're this like society that's all on, that just like all they do is like try to make the world a better place or the universe a better place or whatever. And like, we never really talk about like aliens probably have like fucking hobbies, you know, True. and they go on, vac they go on vacation apparently in Elliot's theory. And I think that's really valid. I think if they're sentient, they do exactly what other sentient things do and they go and observe and they find things that they enjoy to observe and they do that. So I think it's definitely like a destination and like a ooh, look at that thing and like that's it. I don't think they want to like fuck around with us or anything. They they can they space might. they they can space travel. Why why would they fuck around with us? They could go elsewhere in space and probably find it. They if they can they, get they here have, though, they don't, they don't have a reason. I don't I don't think they have a reason. If you can travel, if they can space, get here, to be fair, then they theoretically could fix our problems fairly easily. I guess the same way you could fix your honeysuckle or bittersweet issue that you've got. You could, you're not gonna, but you could. Yeah, but what would they benefit from that? What could we possibly offer? A slice of apple pie. Memes. They might not have memes. See, this Aliens is why they this is, have memes. This, is, this is why they don't kill us, because it would be a waste of their time. That's exactly what I'm saying. <laughs> no, okay. like, yeah, it's not worth it. To not worth it, dude. I'd Sweet. rather go look at something else. That's what I'm saying. We're all Florida people. We're all Florida men. We're all Florida people, but you know who wasn't a Florida person? Here we go. Michael Jackson. Here we go. Akira Mo Akira Mir now I'm not gonna uh. say <laughs> Akira Miyawaki. Is that right? Miyawaki. Akira Miyawaki. Here we go. 
now you can't do that to me. My it's brain is going to be like, there's two options. Nope, never it's, say it's the right Miyawaki. One. Do it with the Miyawaki. E. Miyawaki. It's definitely Miyawaki because it's Miyawaki Forest. Think of it's Akira. Why would it not? It's Akira, like an E. Like and he, it's, uh, the I is followed by a, a vowel or an, a consonant. But it's Japanese. Whereas style. the Y is not. Well, yeah, I could, that's I not could show you Japanese. I, but it's a Japanese name, and I'm telling you that's how it's pronounced. This episode is a fucking disaster. Should we have looked this up before we started recording? <laughs> it's Miyawaki. I'm like 99% sure of it. And if not, I will take the blame. And I will go down to that ship when the aliens show up and say, you fucking idiot. All right. Yeah. Just, like, uh, just like the aliens, Andy and I are on different pages. Just like the aliens. Let us know who's right. D- or don't, if I'm wrong, just for the record. <laughs> so- if I'm wrong... Keep it to your goddamn self. You're catching on, Matt. That's why I keep you around. Yeah. So we're going back to our our favorite place, which is Asia, apparently this season. So we're in Japan for the second time. We've been traveling around that part of the world. and It's been pretty cool. Yeah, and it really has been a wild ride in the Far East Asian land stewardship landscape. But to be honest, I'm having a hard time uh, seeing how all of this like morphed into I guess what we call permaculture today, because that's where we're finding a lot of the same stuff now, right? Yeah, and what we're talking about today, we'll we'll see again being one of those things that's just kind of like how did how did this the Miyawaki forest method become what it becomes? We saw that a bit with like Fukuoka. We've seen that a bit with a number of other folks. It's just this common extractive process that just erases the place where these things come from. Today, we're actually not going to spend much time talking about that. Well, we're kind of always talking about it, so what a relief. Wait, you lost me. What what are we talking about? Perma bros. I'm pretty sure everyone's tired of you talking about them. Listen, much like the aliens, no one's making them listen. Okay, so today we're talking about Mayawaki, Akira Mayawaki. Not aliens, not perma bros, but our boy... Akira. So let's go. Akira. Let's do that. Akira. Ak- <laughs> I was going to do a Shakira thing, but I, I can't. My Spanish is terrible. And I'm so glad. <laughs> Akira. Yeah, no. Um. So anyways, we are. He again. Sad. I know. O for 2. I'm adding that to my Thanksgiving list that you are just going to <laughs> carry over that one. Wait, you're going to thank me for it or? Yeah, thank you for what I'm thankful for. Oh, me being Akira Akira? No, you're just moving on. Oh, moving on. Yeah, that doesn't happen often. So we are talking about the Miyawaki method and a bit about its founder, Akira Miyawaki. While the method name itself probably doesn't sound super familiar, the concept is pretty ubiquitous in like the nature-y porn type part of YouTube. The what? You know what I mean, like the look at this food forest that was created in 10 years. Well, not even necessarily a food forest. Look at this forest created in only 10 years kind of videos where they like walk through and it's a super dense jungle type thing. And usually they'll like throw the word permaculture in there for good measure or food forest or whatever. God, I hate the word food forest. And that's not unsurprising, Mr. Against the Grain over here. Sorry, it's just dumb. Any forest can be a food forest. It just doesn't look like grocery store food. It it makes it sound like it's something new and unique when it's just simply like what forests have looked like for 10,000 years. Dom, can we play this guy off? I'm done. I'm done. All I'm going to say. Anyways, Mayawaki method. Before we can get into the method, let's talk about my boy Akira. We don't know much about his early life, but he was born in Takahashi, Japan, which is in the southern part of Japan, and only about 150 miles from where Fukuoka had been born 15 years prior in 1928. Kind of cool. That's basically everything we know about his life before he was like 40. So didn't you tell me before this that he's like a a fed? (laughs) Yeah. Sounds fetish. So good at being a fed, he actually forgot he was a fed and then dedicated his life to plants. That tracks. By the 1970s, he began to become a a big advocate for natural forests. Now, what exactly did he define as these, quote-unquote, natural forests? In his time as a botanist... So he said. He wasn't a fed. Fed. Anyways, during his time in Japan looking at plants, he noticed that the tree species around, like, temples and shrines and cemeteries were longer-lived, slower-growing trees. 
and these sites, because of their religious significance, hadn't faced the clear-cutting the rest of Japan had experienced. His conclusion was that all the species we think of today as being native to Japan, like the picture of the, the cedars and the cypresses and the pines, were all actually imported to produce timber. And couldn't they be like early succession species? Because of the fact I don't speak or read Japanese and getting any of his own writing in English is like damn near impossible. Like you don't want to know what I had to do to find his most famous book in English. But he's also documented as saying that the conifers that were introduced also were naturally present at high altitudes and extreme environments, which we don't think of today as being like introduced species. Yeah, it's kind of weird. Could it be like a cultural difference? Yeah, I thought a bit about this after I was writing my notes for this. And I started thinking about what you were saying with Fukuoka having like his like vision when he was in the hospital. And I kind of wonder if that like cultural significance and how he framed that plays into what Akira was doing here in the sense of like how he describes it um, in a, a more philosophical than the literal way that we struggle with being Westerners. Now, he calculated that only like 0.06% of forests in Japan were actually these indigenous forests, as he called them. He even suggested that the forests that exist, because they were non-native forests, they were going to be incapable of addressing climate change in Japan. So out of all of that, I, all I got was that you need to brush up on your kanji, bro, because reading Japanese is kind of easy. What's kanji? It's like the characters that they use to like write language. Is this like a um, anime thing? No, so you're just saying like what they use to write words? Yes. Okay. That that seems like a lot of work. I'm just going to I'm just going to read the English. So his his solution was to look to the past. It's not translated. And... Not all of it's translated. Listen. You're missing huge a... chunks of what this guy's I, saying probably. I trust the Japanese translators and that they would translate important things for me because this is the poor Pearl's almanac. Why wouldn't they? If I ask them, <laughs> oh, come on. Okay. Come just, on, Elliot. You, he's asking me to just go with it. Go with it, bro. Be cool, bro. You cool? Don't I look cool? I don't know. I, maybe you're an alien. I'm you're, wearing a fucking a... Ninja Turtle shirt. Of course I'm an alien. <laughs> go, this is a co right that, now. That's what that show is trying to tell you, bro. <laughs> oh my God. My childhood makes so much more sense. Uh, so uh, back to... Akira. So his his solution was to look to the past and to uh, focus on this concept that he called potential natural vegetation, also known as the Kuchler potential vegetation, which was expanded by Reinhold Tuxen. I don't speak German. Sorry, Elliot. Par that could be an easy language to learn, too, I guess. And uh, basically, this is around the idea that the more native, the better, and that if uh, a site is native long enough, it would reach climax vegetation, the term used previously for, like, old growth. So Tuxen was a Nazi, wasn't he? So he was, but in his defense... Don't do that. He... Don't. ...hated Hitler. Was this Hugo Stiglitz? Stiglitz. And <laughs> Anyways, a little off topic. The idea is that native species have optimum ecological resilience for their native environment, and by proxy, have the best potential to enhance biodiversity and meet the challenges of their specific ecotype. Okay, so that makes sense. Yeah, okay, Mr. Blonde Hair, Blue Eyes. They're green. It's like, whatever. <laughs> so what does this have to do with Milwaukee again? Right, so basically he believed that the PNV... Uh, that potential natural vegetation was crucial for developing successful forests, which on one hand is pretty valid when you think about the current state he's talking about, less than like 1% being indigenous. But also, you know, something we've talked about repeatedly is that landscapes aren't static. So like you could do 80-20 native to non-native? Yeah, I'm not saying he's wrong, just, you know, trying to be unbiased or something. My point is that he was really concerned with restoration through forest development. So he went to these sacred places and he collected a bunch of seeds and uh, he started building basically a seed bank for future forests. So I'm going to go out on a limb. But um, Limb, yeah. And so people weren't super happy about that. No, they, they generally weren't. He didn't have a whole lot of support. In fact, his first supporter came in the form of a company trying to do some PR, Nippon Steel. They had tried to create some forest embankments to deal with complaints 
from their neighbors, and the first plantings were just absolute failures. Uh, with the success of the project Milwaukee put together with them, uh, he was able to use the experience to spearhead hundreds of projects across the country and later in his life, even internationally. Something stands out to me, and I don't know if it's just the, the weed talking, I'm a little high, but we have Germany and Japan, which are two of the countries that were, we'd say, big advocates for purity, or were also the biggest advocates for it nationalism purity quote unquote Our, sorry let me try <laughs> not nationalism not nationalism i meant naturalism yeah well in this case are kind of you know they're, they're pretty close. replaceable yeah. yeah and i mean in their defense america is number three so while our xenophobia might not be like number one we're definitely in the top five like holding it down yeah i feel like that's weird but we're definitely gonna be champs in that too Back-to-back World War champs were coming for that title, baby. <laughs> Getting the three fur. Yeah, it's definitely odd. That's for sure. And um, we'll, we'll leave it there. Yeah, I'll just uh, let that one lie. I think the lesson here that we should we can all agree on, despite our alien disagreements, all countries are terrible. Yeah, if countries could just not be that, that'd be just great for everyone. Speaking of things that aren't countries, you guys ready? What's well, not countries? You ready? You ready? You ready? You ready? No. These because I have to say it. These nope. I have to say this. If all countries are terrible, wouldn't that make the whole planet Florida? <laughs> Commercial time. <laughs> that was good. I like that one. Howdy there, fellow preppers. I'm Billy Dane here to tell you about the latest in apocalypse preparedness. Truly, an all-in-one solution: bullets and beans by Bunker Corp. Our scientists here at Bunker Corp have developed a proprietary blend of pinto bean and 45 caliber ACP rounds canned together in a savory, non-corrosive sauce for your consumption and reliable combustion. When shit hits the fan, then ho ho ho, you know it will. You're down your dark bunker, long after your fuel sources run out and your batteries have died, bullets and beans will be there to provide you with a hearty meal best eaten cold simply open the can carefully scoop out a mouthful and spit out the premium center fire rounds within a few bites you've got a full magazine and a full stomach so remember folks it's bullets and beans for your all-in-one solution to nutrition and self-defense make sure it's part of your last days on earth and don't forget to leave one round in the bottom of the can And we're back, and while you were off, we looked at alien pictures, mostly of Elliot. He's like, see all these like shots that people have gotten? I got paid big bucks to do these in the 50s. So that's why he seems like he's always, quote unquote, working, but he's never actually working. You've never seen me work a day in my life. I haven't. Even when we worked next to each other when you were at, was it Pizza Hut? And I was in literally the building next door. Papa Gino's, whatever. We were next door. I never saw your car in the parking lot. It was always in the back. Cannot prove to me you had a job. Can't prove it. Anyways, so besides the aliens pictures, we did also look at the Nippon Steel Forest for these guys to see what a natural forest looks like in Japan or what it should look like according to Mayawaki. So, Matt, how did it look? Foresty? It looked like a forest for sure, but not like what I usually think of when I think of like Japan forests. Okay, so they planted a forest. And if you said 99% of the species were not native, then when you see a native forest, it's going to look kind of different then, right? A lot of oaks. Yeah, basically. And um, while Mayawaki wrote like an extensive collection on native vegetation to Japan, he also wrote a second book, the one you can get in English, The Healing Power of Forest, The Philosophy Behind Healing Earth's Balance with Native Trees. First off, great book. Definitely recommend. Second, if you do want to get it, it's basically impossible to find in print, and there's no PDFs. The only place that uh, sells it in the U.S. in print, and I'm going to give them a massive shout-out, and they're going to have no idea why suddenly a bunch of people order this book. I'm going to have Elliot pronounce it because I butchered it when I was trying to explain it to him. Go for it, buddy. Uh, Risho Kaseikai. Yeah, I would not say that. International of North America. Risho Kaseikai. Cool people. Actually, I don't know anything about them. They might not be, but they do sell this book cheap. Uh, it was 13 bucks shipped, and the other alternative for me was to spend $100 to have it shipped from the UK. Yeah, so shout out to, uh, I'll say it one more time, Risho Kosei Kai. 
support their books and go buy that shit. Read it. I can't wait till someone messages them saying like, yeah, I heard about this book in from these guys on a podcast and it's a bunch of anarchists obsessed with ecology and prepping and whatnot. And just like imagine the look on that face. Some like six year old dude like, okay. It's like, do so, you want the book about the forest? So Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I could picture that transaction. It's gonna be awkward as fuck. And you're just like, I don't give a fuck. It's gonna be amazing. So someone go do that and like film it like in person. So if you want the book and you are in North America, go snag it there. I'm sure they'll be out of stock soon and uh yeah, I don't know where you'll get it from after. Someone better set up a scanner. So before we get into what the process for the Miyawaki Forest looks like, we haven't even really talked about why it's a big deal. Not only is it hugely successful in the literal sense, as in the plants survive versus, you know, many reforestation projects, they also grow incredibly quickly and with incredible diversity. So what exactly is the typical rate for success with reforestation projects? Success is a pretty relative term, so it's really kind of hard to gauge, but Depending on how you want to qualify success, it's typically between like 32 and 95%. Many projects in Southeast Asia show like 80% tree mortality at the decade mark. That does not sound great. Yeah, I mean, it's complicated because a forest thins as it gets bigger, but yeah, 80% doesn't sound great. So in 1999, nearly 30 years into doing these projects, Maiwaki wrote a research paper on his findings. In it, he summarizes the basic premise of his methods as well as the results. Some of the stats he provides in his paper show that compared to 80% mortality on traditional reforestation projects, Miyawaki sites average around 40% mortality. Okay, so half is bad. Twice as good. And that doesn't even address some of the other benefits, but before we get there, let's review the general methodology. It's pretty straightforward, to be honest. Basically, start by assessing the region, not just where you're looking to restore, but anywhere that might, again, thinking of our Germans and our concept of potential natural vegetation, show the natural state and have a clear outline of the species and the vegetation and what could and probably should be there. Now, you can compare that to what's on the site you're looking to restore and see if maybe there are some on that site. You can assess the soil, the water, mineral content, and so on to confirm that it is actually a good site for those species. You identify which ones are keystone and what species are often found in close proximity and replicate those relationships in your planting. And that seems like a lot, but if you go spend some time in the woods, you'll start to notice some commonalities. And I'll quote from Maiwaki, in quote, when we see species combinations, we find high fidelity species for particular communities. These species are called character species. We decide phytosociological units based on the character species. We compare phytosociological units widely from natural forests to secondary communities and decide associations, basic units of a plant community system, which can be applied to worldwide vegetation science. Likewise, we group the units into alliances, orders, and classes by species combinations. In this way, the hierarchical vegetation community system is decided. So I hate to keep harping on permaculture, but this sounds like what they teach is tree guilds, but based in actual relationships, not just like plucking species from around the world and just shoving them together. Yeah, I mean, who would have thought that there's more to it than just saying, huh, I like this fruit tree and I like this fruit tree and I'm going to put this fruit bush underneath it and then I'm going to have this fruit ground cover. Yep. And I don't understand why this doesn't work. And have the vine and then basically yeah. not be able to access any of them. And also they're all going to get enough sunlight to produce while also not having any of these relationships from co-evolving together. Okay, so if Sorry, you're, No, it's fine. If you're <laughs> so if you're smashing all these trees together that aren't native or don't necessarily grow together, when would you figure out like what could be there like when the forest goes through its succession? And that's where that research, that going out and like actually exploring a landscape is really important. Specifically, we have to think about not just what, like, Maiwaki is really focused on this idea of natural vegetation. And I would push back against that a little bit and say, landscapes have been stewarded, and there's always been natural spaces. And there's an important place for some natural spaces to 
be necessary for a healthy ecosystem and in the sense that there should be a patchwork within our forests. But thinking about how people have stewarded these landscapes before global economies allowed massive species shifts across the planet, we can start thinking about what that looks like and how we can find some evidence of what that might have been. Yeah. And if you're looking for more information on that, go check out our pro model series because we Andy did a pretty deep dive into that and I went along for the ride. It was fucking crazy. So go check that out. I'm like Ozzy, crazy train. Uh, <laughs> I'd call you crazy tree. Crazy tree. I like it. Andy, stay away from the bats. You thought COVID-1 was bad. <laughs> the aliens told me, Elliot, COVID-2 is going to be a rocker. Okay. So I mean, how could Florida get worse? I don't, I don't know what you want me to say to that. I don't know. Yeah, that's true. Shout so, out to Florida. If you're there, the, shout I'm, out. I'm glad you're there. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry that you were there. So someone said it. Um, to bring up to Elliot's point, there, the reason we did that series was because like, yes, you should know these histories and that should inform your decision making. You know, it's it's almost like there is a method to to our madness. Yeah. And he keeps trying to sell us that same line over and over again. I don't believe him. Doesn't matter if it's a lie, it could be true, all right? So uh, a little behind the scenes for our listeners, Andy sat down to record the first episode of this podcast after writing the first 500 episodes. Don't tell them that. They don't need to know. You saw that? It's like a Bible, except like, <laughs> interesting. No tomatoes. Yeah, the uh, the tomato episode is like the epilogue. It's it's what they will do without me when I'm dead. <laughs> It's been recorded now. It's you guys are on the hook. Sorry, guys. We're gonna read that whole thing front to back. <laughs> Sadly, Monotone. you make no jokes. Yeah. To get back to Milwaukee again. Uh, so, so we've got the general species choices figured out theoretically, right? We can look at history. We can look at the oldest landscapes or the most undisturbed landscapes around us. We can kind of figure out what those clusters look like. Canopy, understory, maybe a, a tall bush or something like that. You start to see these clusters showing up. From there, we can start collecting seeds and ideally start them in some kind of nursery, which literally can be like your backyard. And once they're 10 to 24 inches tall, they're ready to be planted. Obviously, this can take a few years, but that's okay because the soil, if the site is degraded, which if you're restoring it, it probably is, needs some soil management. While you can't restore, you know, 10 or more inches of topsoil that's been washed away, we can do some things like mixing soil from the region with similar biology, with fresh compost and wood chips, for example, is a great place to start. So it's interesting how there's like a focus on the native soil biology as well, like in the, like KNF. The fact that all of these practices that we've been covering, basically this series, come from the same part of the world as well as KNF and Jadam, and also within about 50 to 75 years of each other, is totally, there's, there's something there, and I haven't quite figured out what it is. With this all figured out, with that fresh soil down, with these trees ready to go to get planted, we can start planting our trees pretty densely, which can be like three per square yard or even denser. Typically, it'll be like with this idea of a companion cluster in each square. So these companion clusters are usually designed with that stacking function from permaculture in mind. Or rather, again, permaculture took this concept and tried to make it all food layers, which again is fundamentally flawed because everything we've talked about. Anyways. Yep. And for anybody who's a new listener or for anybody who's trying to show an episode to a friend, we are in the middle of a full-on tree tirade. So if you need to go forward and back and listen to this shit a couple of times, he goes over tree math and tree timeframes and tree tables. So let's go. Keep going. You mean trigonometry? Yep, that's it. Oh, God. You know, I might just like <laughs> log off at this point. Like, do you... <laughs> whatever. You got something to say, Matt? No, that was just, that was just fucking bad. Yeah, man. That was... <laughs> This is that what I've been raw. dealing with. This is what I've been dealing with. Oh, God. <laughs> it's You're entitled horrible. to financial compensation. <laughs> no, it's isn't it horrible life, though? Like, when you listen to it, you're just like, oh, these guys are fucking around, dude. I'm here every time he does it. And the, my heart skips a beat, and the, the blood pressure <laughs> shoots up to that little vein in my forehead, and it spikes. Yeah. Oh, God, I can see it on the Zoom. I make a dead eye contact when I say it. Just, gonna, just for Elliot. Gonna have a stroke. No blinking. Yikes. Gonna have a stroke. So anyways, the stacking function 
is basically designed with the idea of like putting the absolute tallest trees in the center of the forest, especially when you're dealing with a smaller project as these usually are. Again, they're typically called like tiny forests. And um, they are more expensive up front if you were to buy the plants versus traditional forests, which is why forest projects are usually like poplars, which you can buy super cheap and they're spaced pretty far apart because they want them to grow up. And um, that's not what we're doing here. We're trying to build a natural ecosystem by leveraging the relationships between these plants. So you'll usually have the taller tree and usually two shorter trees beside it. And then surrounding this are the shorter trees with the lower canopy shrubs and so on. And the idea is you're basically building like a mound. Then these mounds or these, these squares are laid out and replicated throughout the site. So if it's a hundred feet by a hundred feet and each of these is, you know, three feet by three feet, then you can kind of do the math, how many of those squares you need, three trees a square, how many of each type of square means how many of each species and so on and so forth. Now, when you're doing this, you'll typically want to have these mounds bordered occasionally by maintenance paths. It's important to think about, you know, you're going to have to water and weed and so on for these sites. Mulching with straw can be used to help reduce that soil erosion and moisture loss. And for the following two to three years, things like weed removal are particularly important and ideally by cutting so you reduce soil disturbance. By year three or so, the canopy should start to already close in and start reducing the weeds. And that's it? Pretty much. The only thing to keep in mind is the a usage of an exterior ring of plants to help reduce nutrient runoff and to reduce cold air blowing into the space. The This area is called the fringe and mantle community, and it's basically like your transitional ecotone, typically around like three feet or so tall with like taller grasses and forbs and things like that. Okay. So that's a really long winded way of saying you just need time and space to figure out all this bullshit. Not even a lot of money. I guess the only input you said was figuring out how to build the topsoil and make it optimal for your region. And that's pretty much it, right? Yeah, basically. I mean, there, it takes time and it takes some skill, but like, it's totally accessible to most people. He argues in his paper that these quasi-natural forests can be formed in Japan in as little as 15 years and 40 years in tropical places. He argues that the wild natural forest in Japan without human intervention would take at least 150 years to develop. And he's basically accelerating that process with dense planting in which trees may not necessarily compete for sunlight, but because of the competition around them, they shoot up more directly instead of wasting energy with things like lateral branching. Yeah, so it seems like the science is like pretty straightforward on it, just about like a proper application. I'd be a bit worried about having all these species end up being the same age in the forest though, right? So his argument is basically that as snags and breaks occur in the, the, the forest through storms and things like that, secondary canopies will develop. It's not expected that all the trees survive and it's actually not even really wanted. The idea is that the healthiest trees survive, the others will feed the soil again and again, coppicing species and openings in the canopies as trees die off, over time will create a natural layering to the forest. Okay, that makes sense. And it seems like the like tree mortality in a planting is kind of like a flawed uh, metric. Yeah, and that's why I was saying like it's hard to really gauge like 35 to 80 percent can seem like a huge scope of like mortality is is it good or bad because it depends. It depends on how close they're planted together. It depends on you know the expectation of that forest is supposed to be an early succession and kind of just be there as a a, a placeholder until older you know more uh, long lived trees move in. So it's really difficult, but I think by and large people understand that the traditional tree projects are not really successful or necessarily beneficial. Okay, that makes sense. He also highlights the benefits of this planting method because of the cooperation between species. In contrast to the competition for like sunlight, he argues that they equitably share the waters and the soil, and the general fitness of the trees is due to positive interactions between the trees. Okay, so we've talked about like primary and secondary and like old growth forests. So how do these successions play into it? 
He recommends not planting many, if any, of the primary stage species because they can often outcompete the slower growing late succession, uh, late stage succession species. But if there's no resources otherwise, then to use them to keep that density high. The density is really crucial here and super important and not just making the trees grow taller, but also crowding out invasives. On one site that he worked on in Malaysia, they compared tree growth between a regular reforestation site and a Milwaukee site. On the traditional one, uh, trees grew around 20 centimeters a year over the first five years. The Milwaukee tropical forest, however, grew 110 centimeters a year, which is about a 550% increase in height. Okay, so that's nuts. And that that's all due to the density again. So they weren't growing outward, they were growing upward, competing. Growing up. Grown up for those nuts. You know what else is nuts? Is it these ads coming up? It's these ads coming it's up. It's these nuts. Oh, oh fuck you. Yeah. Hey there, it's me, Crazy Norm, down at Normal Norm's Nut Emporium on John Brown Drive. We're going nuts for nuts in Nutty November. We've got big nuts, small nuts, chestnuts, ground nuts, nut butter, buttery nuts, nut milk, milky nuts, nut cream, creamy nuts, and the for the late night crowd, chocolate covered CBD, deep fried nuts. Want to join the nut extravaganza? Nut up and join the nut posse. Join other members and get your sack of nuts pounded for free whenever you come in and make the creamiest nut milk you've ever had in your own kitchen. Crazy Norm's Nut Emporium, 420 John Brown Drive or online at boreproles.com. Welcome back, everyone. We're talking about Milwaukee, not these nuts, and reforestation, and whether or not Andy just wants an excuse to try his secret compass pasture theory. I told you about that in secret. Wait, what? Nothing. Now I want to know. See what you did, Matt? All right, we can, we'll, we'll have to talk to Dom. You guys can't have secrets so, from me. I'll get paranoid. <laughs> oh, it's the alien in you. It's that part alien. It's the fed in you. So now, now I will, it's half I will, fed, I will fucking half black fed, vaporize and you. half alien. <laughs> it all makes sense. Does the men in black thing work over Zoom? Oh, I hope not. We'll find out. Anyways, I had this idea. So we've talked a bit about like how quickly trees can coppice. So what if, hear me out, if we planted like super dense trees, like every foot and put them on like a coppicing system of every year, it's like, think of the idea of like fodder blocks they do in Brazil, but instead of blocks every five feet, you've got like stumps every foot. So it's like basically growing grass, but with the root system of a tree and you can just like have the cows or whatever go through it. And you can also use them on like super steep slopes where you couldn't otherwise really produce anything. I don't. Uh, is it alien to you, Elliot? Yeah, I don't understand any of that. Good. All I'm picturing is like a uh, like a one giant tree stump that's like connected together. Kind of. It'd be like a foot apart. They'd probably eventually be together. It would be one giant like tree stump. That's what that would. Can be. you imagine a, a tree slope? That'd be freaking dope. Like in the in the winter, like when the snow gets packed down. Like the amount of like speed you could get off of that thing. You've never been doing snow. You've never done snow sports before. Have I don't you? go outside in the snow. You, you don't. Know this. I don't think you have. No, you, he has the. Oh, my God. Can we please move on? He's like a little hole in the basement. He just hides away. I do. I writes podcast episodes. He does. It's down. And then I have my fire. So I have my wood stove going all winter. So my house is like 85. And his homemade wine. Sitting around in shorts. And don't go outside. Kids go to school. Good luck. See you there. Don't be like me. Actually, Andy. I won't. Come back. <laughs> uh, yeah, don't be like me. Speaking of not being like me, let's talk about urban forests. So we've hinted a bit that Milwaukee forests were originally designed for urban spaces. And I really want to talk a bit about how accessible this is, because that's what this podcast is all about, for like the average listener. What time is it, everyone? Micro forest time. time. Yeah. <sighs> Elliot, you did nothing for that. Uh, micro forests? I just learned about micro greens. I can't keep up with you Caucasians. <laughs> <laughs> so let's talk about micro forests. How small can they be? Well, first, we know the benefits of greening urban landscapes, right? We've got air pollution, temperature regulation, water retention, species diversity, sound pollution, habitat. All these things that they can benefit, never mind like the human mental health benefits. A 60 foot wide Miyawaki forest, which is like, I don't know, the width of one like regular house, 
one and a half regular houses, has been documented to reduce sound pollution by 10 decibels within 10 years. That might not mean anything to you, but 10 decibels increase is about 10 times louder than anything before it. So that's like the difference between like a, a chainsaw and a concert. Further, Miyawaki forests have been shown to increase diversity rates by 18 times compared to conventional forests. So I'm assuming that's partly because of the diversity the site is given at planting and then the species that the diversity attracts? Exactly, and the density of the small trees allows for better transfer of nutrients and water between trees, increasing the success rate and also reinforcing those natural companionships that we had seen in most old-growth forests. By trying to support the fungal and bacterial community through those inoculated soils that we talked about and planting trees closely together so those underground networks are available, they're given the tools to be most successful. But to bring this all back to that question of how small can they be, yes, they can be 60 feet wide, but some of these forests have actually been documented as small as 1,000 square feet, which is only like a 40 by 25 foot space. That's awesome. So I didn't hear you talk about like vegetation, shrub layers, any of those like other pieces that you would usually see in a forest. So this is an area, despite Kira Miyawaki's death, is continuing to be explored and refined. Shabendu Sharma has been recognized as kind of carrying the torch on Miyawaki's methods, and he answers exactly what you're bringing up to an extent, and argues that since grasses are not typically a part of the old growth stage of a forest, they shouldn't necessarily be included. I mean, like, sometimes they are, but maybe not like in Japan usually, or India. Yeah, I can't speak for where he's working, and I, I agree with you. I think the idea is that because the trees have such a big impact on the site, those species kind of naturally find their way into the understory, but these are still something relatively new in the United States. And um, it's important to recall, if we are talking about planting 40 or more species of native trees, not all of those are going to be canopy trees, but will include those understory and lower shrubs. And again, this isn't painting with a, a broad brush in terms of that species makeup. It's not just what can grow there, but what once likely did specifically. Okay, so it sounds like Miyawaki is trying to create that complex system that we talk about so much. Uh, does he leave room for more complexity in his idea of a forest, or is it just like a cookie cutter model to make like a basic successional forest? So I think what does we that have make to sense? Do, yeah, I mean, I think what we have to understand uh, with the Miyawaki method is the context and not as a solution for all forests that we don't just want old forests, but they do serve a very specific purpose. So you're saying this is like the continued development of the method? Yeah, he was really just basically like, he tried this thing and it worked, and he was very in support of the idea of people showing that you could do it better in different ways. I feel like those people, like you'll meet them sometimes, and those are like the best teachers that are like, please prove me wrong. Okay, so what I'm hearing is, Miyawaki hit the plant world with one of Andy's patented yes and no answers, and I kind of hate it. Ooh, so ooh. I just want answers from one of you fucking tree people. No, no answers. We don't do answers here. We just do more questions. <laughs> so what this what this all really comes down to is that building resiliency in our ecosystem requires that we really, really understand that ecosystem. Like, not on a piece of paper, but with hands-on experience, because... That's the only way you're really going to understand it at this depth. And restoring it can be as simple as spending time in that landscape, harvesting the seeds from the native species, growing them in planters, and restoring them into the landscape, well, which is particularly easy if the topsoil isn't too degraded. A reminder here that we also have our new project called the PPA Eco-Agricultural Sites, which is focused in this area of rewilding and developing the resources to do this kind of work which you can find more about at ppasites.org. Yeah, and this is a good way for the people who are asking for ways to grow food in urban settings. If you have access to abandoned lots or a considerable amount of space, check it out. And since we've talked about composting already, as well as KNF and Jadam, we've put together some really great resources on topsoil amending without like a huge amount of resources. Unlike what Elliot suggests, it's almost like there's a method to all of this. Almost. Almost, Elliot. And you, you keep saying that it doesn't make it true. And I think it's important to recognize that despite the argument that 
these are supposed to be sites without human intervention. Again, I disagree a bit and say that these landscapes were probably lightly guided by humans, which is why, coincidentally, the species in this landscape end up being mostly food bearing for humans, even if it's not the food we traditionally think of when we say, and I cringe saying it, food forests. You drop the F words. When are you starting your PDC class, Andy? You know what? I hate you guys. Anyways, this is about everything I've got for this episode. If you're interested in learning more, check out the show notes. And in a couple of weeks, we're going to be going in a completely different direction with the new miniseries. And I'll give you a hint. It's going to be sweet. Yeah, and all the terrible jokes you drop, nobody's going to understand what the fuck you're talking about or hinting at with that. But I do have a couple of notes here from this episode. If you are a tree person, I hope I didn't offend you. You're all kind of weird. Oh, I had one more thing. So when you brought up Japanese mini forests, all I could think of was like a, a, a lot, like a parking lot size of like bonsai trees. Would that count as like a mini forest? I mean, not if they're tiny. Like how's a squirrel going to climb up? Bonsai is supposed to be tiny. That's the whole point. Yeah, but how's a squirrel going to climb up a bonsai tree? You get a miniature squirrel. Where are you getting a miniature <laughs> squirrel? Is this like an alien thing, Elliot? You have to, you have to train the squirrel with a uh, wire. See, now I'm a tree person. I'm just asking questions. There are no answers, Andy. Fuck you. How do you like it? It <laughs> yes sucks, doesn't no. it? Yeah, yes it's and no. Complicated. Yeah, it sucks. We'll do a whole hour episode on it. It'll make no I think sense. we need to send Elliot home. Elliot, go home. <laughs> go back to your planet. I am, I am home. Okay, bye. Okay. <laughs> All right, that's, yeah. it. Good no, that's, it. Yeah. that's the end of the episode. Cut it off, Tom. We're-